Hey everybody, welcome back to the podcast. It is the daily. It is Wednesday morning and Bill Landis is very busy. He's occupied elsewhere. So Jeremy Birmingham is in. We're one day behind because of uh, the holiday, New Year. We wish you a very happy New Year as we all get moving. And we push back five questions to Tuesday on ohiostate.rivals.com. And typically when that happens the next day, we let Bill Landis tackle it. But again, we got Berm instead. And it'll be Maybe just as good. I don't know. We'll see. Definitely won't be as good. Um, but also, <laughs> it's it's a time to reflect on what we've learned uh, about Ohio State in the last five months on um, the podcast. But it's also a time to remind people out there that we're flying by the seat of our pants, baby. And <laughs> at any minute, the rules can change. And we are uh, heading into the offseason with an enthusiasm unknown to mankind, ready oh. to attack and dominate and caffeinate and mac and cheese bite our way all the way through 2022. Oh, my. Yeah, I'm just mashing it all together. That was a lot, even borrowing from future NFL coach Jim Harbaugh. I mean, yeah, I mean just... whatever. We may as well just bring it up, right? Let's. I mean, that is that is the daily from now on, right? We don't have very specific organized plots. I mean, everything's everything's on the table at this juncture, and why not talk about Jim Harbaugh and his obvious uh, – you know, willingness and want to get back to the NFL. Maybe that's for another day. Probably because we're just going to find out which job he's begging to take because it changes every single day. Although something that is not different is that even though he said last year he was done pursuing them, you and I both said we know that's not true and that he doesn't really mean it. And we're going right through this rigmarole all over again. But that's Michigan. We're talking about Ohio State. Yeah. Yeah, because in the, the very real possibility that in three weeks we'll have NFL, you know, media out there saying that Ryan Day is a candidate for a head coaching job. And we'll just have to do this every year uh, <laughs> to infinity and beyond infinity and beyond. OK, so my five questions is Ohio State gets uh, prepared for 2023. The ones that must be addressed, the most pressing topics are available for your reading pleasure. And we'll get into those because I think Byrne probably has many that are the same. Uh, but it's just cooler to hear him say them. What's well, number one? I mean, obviously, it's the quarterback situation. That it has to be. Anytime you are um, anointing a new leader of your football team, it is the biggest question on the team, bar none. Um, and especially when you are once again entering a season that neither guy has played really meaningful reps in his career. Obviously, Kyle McCord has a career start under his belt. Devin Brown has three read options under his belt. So it's not. Uh, it shouldn't be from that perspective – a battle you think that Kyle McCord is line in is in line to be the next starter and I think as Ohio State gets back to practice in the next month that is the way it will be uh, handled presumptively but there is certainly an opportunity for Devin Brown to win that job and Kyle McCord is not going to be able to just assume that it's his without a fight yeah so this will be the first of you know potentially nine months of conversation at a minimum four uh, as Ohio State We've seen how Ryan Day handles these before. He is not going to say, I don't think, by the middle of April, who his starter is. He's going to say, well, these are the first 15 practices, uh, and then we count starting a training camp. That's practice 16. It's all one thing. We've been through this before. We know that that's how it's going to work, whether he's picking a starter, whether it's Justin Fields, whether it's a backup situation. That is what he does. So the only thing that can change that is if somebody takes a clear-cut 15 practices there's no doubt in anyone's mind that that's the starting quarterback that he would could conceive of changing that and the only way that the situation would be different in my mind is if Devin Brown is that guy who surpasses as the number one we don't have to spend a ton of time talking about that right now because it's January 4th uh, but that is going to be the tenor of the conversation as we move forward because when you lose a two-time Heisman finals that's a pretty big deal yeah the question is not really not even just Who's the better quarterback? Uh, it, it is about who does the team respond to. It's about who who leads in the locker room. Who is who's really bringing juice in a different way? I mean, there's a lot of different things that are going to be taken into account here. It's not just that Common Core's been in the in the system a, a year longer. It's not just that Devin Brown is more athletic. It's not. I mean, there's going to be a lot of things that you that they have to balance out. And um, ultimately, what you do know or what we do know is that the players on the team are very comfortable with either guy and they like both of them. They feel like they're both capable of leading the team. And so now you have an opportunity to step up and show that it, this is your team. Um, CJ Stroud moving on. Uh, I mean, maybe, maybe he returns. <laughs> um, 
you know, it, it is certainly um, don't put big, that out there. It's a big moment for both of those guys, and they they know what's coming. Um, and to me, one of the more interesting side notes is whether or not uh, 2023 signing Lincoln Keenholz decides to enroll early. He's still making up his mind. He's got about, I mean, a week to figure it out. He's currently in San Antonio at the All-American Bowl um, working down there and getting a chance to work with guys like Brandon Ennis and Carnell Tate and Noah, Noah Rogers. And maybe maybe that will change his mind, getting to, getting some time with those guys early because um, that is going to add an, an interesting wrinkle. Not that he'd be expected to compete necessarily for the starting job, but if you have to, you get a chance to see what he can do at Ohio State early. Maybe, I mean, if we're going to really get into the weeds here, we know that the hope, I think, in most cases, is that Kyle McCord proves without a doubt he's the best guy, right? Like, that would be ideal for Ohio State because... For the future of the quarterback position, that is the ideal outcome. Right. So, But it, it's not going to be his job unless he proves that. So um, that it puts a little bit more of a of a spotlight on him if Keenholz is there to say, hey, we, we now know what this guy can do. So if Kyle's not the guy, maybe you feel more comfortable going to Devin because we all assume whatever, you know, based on college football and the way it's going, that if Kyle McCord does not win the job outright, that it seems likely he would look elsewhere. That may be easier for Ohio State to consider if they feel confident that Keenholz was good enough to play in an emergency role if Devin Brown was ended up needing to to sit for any reason. So that's a lot of rigmarole. A lot of Well, that uh, won't be the last time that we talk about A lot about of ricketa Yeah, a lot yeah. of ricketa rackada. Yeah, I don't I'm not familiar with that term, but it sounds right yeah. uh, for what for what you're saying. Um because you else, still haven't Bert? seen Death to Smoochie. I'm trying to tell you to see Death to Smoochie. If you've ever watched Death to Smoochie, you'd know what the ricketa rackada is. Anyway, it didn't catch on anywhere else. No, because it's a very niche thing or niche, depending on who you ask. Um, <laughs> to me, th there are so many questions, but I said it on a podcast with Andrew uh, when we were doing talking stuff about two months ago that I thought the most important recruiting job for Jim Knowles was going to make sure that Tommy Eichenberg returned for his senior season or his you know uh, fifth season at Ohio State. Um we had firmly believed that that was going to be the case in the last two weeks, three weeks. Coming off of the Peach Bowl, we're hearing it might not be exactly that concrete and that there is now at least a chance that him and Cade Stover are considering a departure for the NFL draft. And uh, that, to me, is one of those season-changing moves, if it happens, because you would love to be able to just pencil in an All-American linebacker in the middle and say, we're going to build the defense around this guy because you're going to need somebody to step up on the edge. You're going to need cornerbacks to emerge and be leaders and and be shut down guys on the outside now that hopefully they'll have a full offseason of being healthy and getting reps. You're going to need two new safeties at least to step up and, and figure out how to play the position in a very you know safety-driven defense for Jim Knowles' safeties that uh, had flat tires in the last month. So how do you how, – how, how can you comfortably do that if you don't have that rock solid piece in the middle of Tommy Eichenberg, and if he is not a hundred percent sold on coming back, that is the first and foremost, most important thing for Ohio state to address this off season in the next 12 days. Yeah. I don't blame either of those guys for wanting to make absolutely certain of their decision. That's, that's what they should do. Um, removing themselves from the emotion of not only, you know, being in their household and like bouncing ideas off of each other or, you know, being around the brotherhood and thinking that you never want to leave that uh, sometimes that could maybe cost you money or cost you opportunity. Uh, then you also want to be clear of the emotion. You don't want to let the peach bowl and what happened there uh, be the only thing that drives you. Uh, it's it's one of the most pivotal, pivotal, pivotal choices that they're ever going to make in their life and for their livelihood moving forward. So they should take their time. Uh, I, we know that both of them got NFL draft evaluations and that both of them were encouraged that they should return to school. Um, whether how much that's changed since then, uh, you know, I wouldn't put a percentage on. I still feel like they're more likely to return than leave. Um, I think they know deep down uh, the the benefits of that and the risks of of leaving, what that could mean for them. But again, that's up to them and what makes them uh, their most most happy, most satisfied with their choice. Like. You can't yeah. fault them either way. They've given a ton to Ohio State. 
Yeah, and the question is different for Kate Stover than it is for Tommy Eichenberg even, especially now people have been asking on Twitter and, and on the OhioState.Rivals.com message board about Stover's health. We've been hearing, I've heard that like it's very likely he could miss the next five or six weeks of workout. So if that's the case, then he wouldn't really be able to be full go or ready for the NFL Combine at the end of February. And if if you're banking on the NFL drafting you in the second or third round based on what they saw in the first eight games when you were healthy, that's well and good. But the last half of the season, Cade Silver was not himself, and now he's going to be tasked with recovering from a back injury that is going to slow him down. And for a guy that his entire game is predicated on physicality and violence and his athleticism that I don't think people um, really know he has, if he can't go there and show that in person, then I don't know how – that translates to being drafted um, as a like surprisingly higher pick than people thought. I, I would imagine that would drop him into the fourth or fifth, as opposed to a second or third, and, and that's a that's a hefty change. It sure is. Um, okay, couple couple roster situations there. What about the coaching staff, Brian? Well, I mean, you have certainly uh, hammered the point uh in the in this season <laughs> that there 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 is always and will always be discussion about larry johnson's future period we know that that has been bandied about on the internets for the last five years um larry johnson hates it he hates hearing it um he continues to insist that he is sticking around and he's not leaving anywhere for a couple more years i know that the players on the roster want that um i don't know that that's what ohio state needs or wants i mean we've seen a fairly sharp decline in productivity on the defensive line in the last three years. Some of that certainly is because you lose guys like Chase Young and Nick Bosa and Joey Bosa. Uh, that is not easy to replace, but I don't know how much Larry Johnson's bread and butter in the recruiting world really translates to today's athlete and the priorities that the recruits around the country have now, as opposed to what they did five, six years ago, because NIL has changed the game so much. Those great relationships, those grandfather slash, you know, role model relationships are valuable and they will certainly last for a while, but it doesn't seem like they are getting people in the door with quite the frequency they were once. So um, I'm interested to see if Ohio State believes it's time to modernize its uh, recruiting approach on the defensive side of the ball, period. Um, if you look at offense, you have elite offensive recruiters like Brian Hartline, Keenan Bailey will be. Tony Alford certainly had a, a rough go of it uh, this cycle, but is a is a is a guy that's in a lot of ways similar to Larry Johnson, and that he's building these relationships based on something totally different. Um, and and I, I wonder if he suffered a little bit of the same consequence in this 2023 cycle that Johnson did, uh, based on how do you adjust to this new world of recruiting. Um, and then you have to ask yourself if you're a Ryan Day. I mean, this was sort of the big conversation on Monday um, as Kirk Herbstreet sort of casually dropped it in a production meeting. Ryan Day told him he was going to let go of play calling responsibilities next year. I don't know that that's a fact or not. Um, I know it's what Ryan Day has talked about previously. So I know it's something he understands he probably has to do. But if that's the case, do are any of the guys on the current coaching staff ready to be the play caller for Ohio State? And that's something I don't know. I don't. I don't know that I believe that definitively. Um, and I also wonder if, in Ryan Day's mindset of take of giving up control over some of the day to day operations, does that mean he's more willing to have a quarterback coach that is perhaps his own quarterback coach, as opposed to Corey Dennis, who is sort of a proxy for Ryan Day? I didn't know uh, that leading up to Saturday night, we were just supposed to drop all that information that we had about the future plans before they were confirmed. I was told as well as Kirk Herbstreit apparently was that Ryan Day was prepared to give up the reins. Didn't think that uh, there was a great incentive to rush that information out until they had an actual plan in place. The game just happened uh, half a week ago and they're going to have to sort through a lot of logistics. When Justin Fry was hired away from UCLA, there was an understanding in a or a conversation or both, however you want to phrase it, that when Kevin Wilson inevitably got a second shot, whenever somebody gave him one to take over, that, uh, that Justin Fry would be the offensive coordinator and ascend back into that role and take that title. 
since he had that previously at UCLA. Now, Chip Kelly called those plays as well, so it's not as if Justin Fry has uh, that on his resume necessarily. And there is a conversation that has to have about if you need an offensive line coach on the sideline. Ohio State is probably much better equipped to let someone like Justin Fry go upstairs if that's this hypothetical, if we follow that strand all the way down, because Mike Salini would be on the sideline. Wasn't necessarily the exact situation when Ed Warner did that and and struggled to do so in 2015. Um, you know, I between Justin Fry and Brian Hartline, there are two guys that they would very much want to have that experience. And to your point, are they ready to do that? I don't know. Uh, that's a that's a it is a tall task to ask anybody to do something for the first time at a place like Ohio State. Um, and especially in a season that's going to be so pivotal as next season is for Ohio State. The schedule is not easy. It's a year that Ryan Day could very easily find himself on the hot seat if he ends up losing in Ann Arbor. Like, is that is this the time to give all that responsibility to someone who's never had it? Well, and he also called one hell of a game in the Peach Bowl um, against Georgia and put up 41 points against one of the best defenses in the country. He can still do it. And now what you have to keep in mind about that is that he had a week and a half with no transfer portal to monitor, no NIL conversations, no signing class to work through. All those things are on his plate for the rest of the year, and especially uh, from September 1st through the end of November. And that's really where it becomes a problem because on a week-in, week-out basis, that's where his plate becomes overflowing, and he doesn't get to devote as much time to coaching, actual football, getting into a rhythm looking at a play sheet over and over and over when he has to split his time and so many other uh, split that pie in so many other directions and, and give it out, uh, give his attention out to a lot of different areas. Like he has to become, I think more of that CEO, or at least he recognizes that he should. Uh, we've talked about that a number of times about looking at the college football playoff era and head coaches calling plays there. Not a lot of them win national championships. Ryan day was very close to changing that. But I don't think that that would have changed his mind about what is best for him moving forward, because that's just, you know, if you're going to do that job and then have to answer for fourth and two decisions every Saturday while you're trying to think about NIL propositions and managing your roster and everything else like that's that's too much, even if you're making nine million a year. Yeah. And it, it as you said, it, you see a, you see the result. Uh, on the field, and we saw it in the middle point of this season, where Ohio State seemed to stagnate a little bit. And you wonder, and we kept kept wondering, when are they going to do some of the stuff that we've seen them do? And I think what you saw this season was a a regression to the mean. Like we can do just this and beat these teams, uh, and thought that that'd be enough. And and in this day and age, I mean, I talked about this with Bill um, last month. But when you're watching a, a Washington State play Washington, and both play callers are much more dynamic than what we saw out of anything uh, Ohio State did in the in the first 12 games of this year. You go, wow, that is unexpected. And I know some of the times that happens because you have less talented players and you have to uh, scheme up some things that are a little bit more um, trickeration um, centered, but you want to see a team that is constantly being aggressive and on the go. And I think as Bill wrote about on Monday, uh, or I'm sorry, on Sunday, and as he talked about um, on the podcast uh, live show from Roosters on Monday. If if what we saw on Saturday is the Ryan Day you get play calling from this moving forward and that sort of personality, that sort of in your face, brash, this is my program, I'm going to own it. I'm all, I'm totally on board with it because that's the Ryan Day that is going to win national championships. Yeah, I think that's one way to help get that personality, I think, is if he doesn't he's going to be very very involved with the offensive game plan. And deciding what goes in what bucket and what they're going to call, like he's that's not going to change no matter what. But I think, you know, the ability to adjust, especially on the sideline, especially if you're trying to talk to officials, if you have uh, to go make adjustments, you're not really paying attention to the defense, the the clock management part of the game, all that other stuff. Like uh, to to have that in your mind, I think that just removing that allows some clarity. Um, you know. Maybe if that was the case, he would think fourth and one is not the situation for a fake punt. I'd rather have CJ out there. And you can still make those calls. You have a better idea of that, maybe. That's not to pick on that specific one. But um, I th I think every coordinator, virtually every coordinator that I've covered in my career, 
feels like they have a better understanding of the flow of the game and what defenses are doing to them when they're up in the box and can see that big picture and they're removed from the emotion of a sideline. Ryan Day has been very good at it, very, very good at it. But, you know, what does it look like upstairs? How much influence could somebody have to really uh, change the game or grow their career? I think that that is worth pursuing. But as you said, there's an obvious risk to that because Ryan Day's career, if he were to, not just in Ann Arbor, but if something goes sideways in South Bend or, you know, you don't get back to Indianapolis next year. Or Madison, Wisconsin. Or, I mean, yeah. it, it's not an easy schedule for Ohio State next year. Yeah, that's that's a very different conversation. And then other people will be asking him to give up more than play calling. So that's that's fraught with risk. But we've also talked about this in like last year with Jim Knowles. Like, Ryan Day is not generally risk averse in those situations. And he makes aggressive hires and he's not putting his head in the sand about the issues of the program. So if he came to that conclusion about himself, which he, which I'm told he did before the Peach Bowl, that tells you he are, how much thought has already gone into that and what he thinks is in the best interest of himself and Ohio State going into 2023. Yeah, and, it, and the question is, how does the rest of the coaching staff get affected? We still don't know exactly who Kevin Wilson's hiring at Tulsa. Uh, the reality of college football is that many times assistant coaches who are working with a coach who gets a head coaching job, end up traveling with him. There's a very real opportunity for Parker Fleming to, to travel and, and be become a much more important part of a program at, at Tulsa, uh, at least on a you know game day operation than he is at Ohio State. So maybe he wants that after being at Ohio State in two separate stints in the last decade. I mean, if that happens, does Ryan Day bring in a full-time special teams coach or does, does it allow you to get flexible and and give Corey Dennis some other responsibilities if he's still if he's still there? And then who's the who's the quarterback coach who's the play caller who's the special teams guy like is keenan bailey better a better fit as special teams slash tight ends coach even though we know he's going to be very involved in in game plan prep like uh you know kevin wilson was brian hartline's getting more involved in that tony alfred's the run game coordinator justin fry's the co you know associate head coach everyone's got all these titles how do you mesh it all mesh mesh it all together to to make it work and a lot of that is moot at this point or could be moot because if if Parker Fleming goes to Tulsa or uh, Corey Dennis goes to Tulsa, I mean, we just don't know what's happening. We get asked a lot about Parker Fleming, I think way more than um, virtually any other special teams coordinator in the country. Um, I would say most most fans and most fan bases don't actually know who's leading that at their programs elsewhere. Um, you know, I, the suggestion, I think you slipped it in there it just for conversation's point, like, do you need a full-time special teams coordinator? Well, if Ohio State struggled to execute with one, I'm not sure what the benefit would be to trying to go without one. How could they improve without full-time attention on that would be my question. I know a lot of other programs do that, but you know, it was asked of, uh, of me on OhioState.Rivals.com whether it would be better if they had somebody who could coach the linebackers full-time. Well, the linebackers were the most improved unit on the team last year, in my estimation, with Tommy Eichenberg and Steel Chambers. So it seems like Jim Knowles knows uh, what he's doing there and doesn't actually need the help. Um, you know, the other the counterpoint to that was that somebody thought that Parker Fleming didn't do enough value, bring enough value to the recruiting side, which may well be true. I don't know what the solution is, what Ryan Day will arrive at, but I'm I feel pretty confident that he does still want a full-time special teams coordinator and that for the most part, he's been pretty happy with what Parker Fleming's knowledge of the game and how the stuff that he teaches in special teams translates to offense and defense. We can all agree. I think that Ohio state's execution in that phase of the game this year was not what the program expects. No, because you had two or three vital moments that uh, you had schemed up the whole season for. And in each instance, they fell through and didn't work, not just didn't work, but weren't even, able to try because of penalties and um, too many guys on the field and and not snapping the ball to the right guy, et cetera. I also think that, you know, you're talking about linebacker and, and Coy McFarland does not get a lot of uh, publicity or press, but he's a big part of what Jim Knowles does. And again, when you're thinking about Kevin Wilson building a staff, then that that's something you probably need to pay attention to. Matt Guerrero, who is an analyst for Ohio State on the defensive side, a former Duke full-time assistant, um, we believe is heading to Tulsa with, with uh, Wilson. So, these are the little pieces that the Ohio State has in place that allow guys like Jim Knowles to not do as much 
recruiting, et cetera, because McFarland and Guerrero do. So now how do you fix that? There's there's a lot of moving parts. That, and that's mm. uh, that's sort of by design, I think, in college football. We, we expected that we'd have this new rule with you can have more, uh, you know, full time coaches and, and doing more inst- instruction and that kind of stuff. That doesn't seem like it's going to happen now. So a lot of these things that Ohio State was building toward uh, don't seem to be in place. And that. I think it leads to my next real big question for the off season. And it's not as much about the football team. It's about the administration and NIL and how they uh, attach it. Because that, I think you, I don't think you can head into this off season without having a much more structured and much more solid plan in place for name, image and likeness and the way Ohio state's going to uh, approach that. Yes, I agree. Great point. I don't know what else to add about it. We talked about yeah. it. I mean, it's, like, but it has to yeah. be done and it just has to, it has to be figured out and that has to be figured out before Ohio state kicks off for spring football. Yeah. I think the last two things that you said, it's interesting to uh, juxtapose them because Ohio state was working to be on the cutting edge by bringing in a lot of analyst quality control people under the assumption that that rule that the uh, AFCA wanted to approve, which was basically removing the cap and having unlimited assistant coaches available like they were in position to do that yeah alabama had already been doing that but those two were going to have the biggest most comprehensive coaching staffs in the country and what an advantage that was going to be ohio state was willing to do that and push the envelope and they weren't doing that necessarily to the same extent with name image and likeness and then the cap was (laughs) removed essentially from nil and then the cap stayed on for the coaching staff because suddenly everyone in the NCAA realized, well, gosh, hiring practices aren't the same across all 50 states. That could be a problem. Uh, what if somebody hires uh, a recruit's dad and puts them on the coaching staff now that they have unlimited positions? That seems like that could be a problem. Maybe we need to monitor that um, and pre- put put something in place to prevent it. They had all these other issues that suddenly they just didn't think of until beforehand when Ohio State was already barreling down that road. They chose that lane. Then it got cut off. And meanwhile, the other one is wide open. Yep. Life is a highway. <laughs> yeah. Well, I mean, there's so many, th- right now. there's so many questions uh, uh, that are need to be answered in this off season, not just about Ohio state football, but the big 10. I mean, we talked uh, in jest about Jim Harbaugh, but everything changes. Everything can change very quickly in the big 10. Um, I think it's a conference that heading into the 2023 season is positioned with its current coaching roster and with what's happening around the league to be the strongest conference in college football head to toe top to bottom i don't think the sec is better than the big 10 next year just looking ahead um obviously you still have the the top couple teams are are fairly even but between ohio state michigan penn state the balance of power in, in the big 10 is is not really going anywhere but in the western half of the league with matt rule with luke fickle like with uh what brett, brett bielam has done at illinois it's getting better and better, and uh, the Ohio State can't be comfortable just with the status quo and pretty much anything at this point. Yep, a lot of questions to answer for Ohio State as 2023 gets rolling. Uh, the wheels are already in motion for the Buckeyes. They have to manage the transfer portal, manage NFL draft decisions, make sure they have everything squared away with the coaching staff, uh, recruiting for next year, name, image, likeness. Uh, so many things always happening at Ohio State. There's no off season really anymore in college football. And that's why the podcast daily will keep on trucking for the entirety of this year and beyond to infinity and beyond as mm-hmm. Berm and Buzz Lightyear have both so eloquently stated. Nice. Uh, that'll do it for this morning. There are probably like 10 more questions we could get to, but we'll still have a couple more episodes. Offensive line, week. cornerback, safety. I mean, name it. We, we all know <laughs> they're everywhere, folks. We'll get to them. I promise. We will. Uh, that is a guarantee for the podcast daily. He's Berm. I am Austin. We'll talk to you later.